This project was supported in part by a grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services, creating strong libraries and museums that connect people to information and ideas. This presentation was made possible by the grant project entitled The Boomers Reflecting, Sharing, Learning by the Institute of Museum and Library Services National Leadership Grant, the Athens Regional Library System, and the Linden House Arts Center. We're talking today with John Dowd, who is a semi-retired geology professor at the University of Georgia. And he was in the Army in a very different capacity than anyone that we've talked to so far uh, about being a Vietnam veteran. Uh, why don't you tell us the unit that you were in, John? I was, when I was in Vietnam in 1970, I was an advisor with the 52nd Vietnamese Ranger Battalion, Vietnam Quang, in, uh, in an area of what was called Three Corps. And this is actually the yeah. patch for that, yeah. or you could yeah. show this, that's where the words you just said yeah. were, the Vietnamese words, and right. that's what the Vietnamese uh, Army mm -hmm. lifted higher, right. it's just a thing, and, uh, mm -hmm. and then to show that you weren't right. part right. of the we, Vietnamese. We wore, we wore this patch on our right shoulder, and then the scroll that uh, said Vietnamese Rangers. This is the same scroll, basically, that all American Ranger units wear that designate oh. the Ranger Battalion. And in Vietnam, the ranger advisors wore it and said Vietnamese rangers. And so yeah. what kind of things were you advising the Vietnamese uh, army on? Well, we had, it was a four-man team. We had two officers and two NCOs, two sergeants. The, um, the senior officer was, who was called the senior advisor was a captain, Don Valentine, when I first got there. I was the assistant senior advisor. I was a, a second lieutenant when I first got in country and then promoted to first lieutenant after I'd been there about two months. And then the, the senior sergeant had been in country about two years and had a, a Vietnamese wife. And, uh, and then there was a junior sergeant, and we actually rotated like three or four <laughs> the time I was there. They didn't seem to last very long for some reason. And uh, when, we, when the Vietnamese ran an operation, uh, we went with them and provide, you know, usually with the headquarters element, uh, battalion or company, and uh, acted as liaison between any American support that was required and the, uh, and the Vietnamese. For example, if, if the, uh, the Vietnamese needed a, an American medevac helicopter, dust off it was called, then uh, uh, we would, well, they would always call for Vietnamese first, but they would never show up, right? So they, They'd call for an American one, and we'd call for an American one. And, uh, but the pilots would come up on our frequency and would only talk to, uh, to an American. They wouldn't talk to the Vietnamese. And, uh, and then it was our responsibility to direct them on the ground, et cetera. I suppose they only talked to Americans in case it would have been a, a Vietnamese trick of the right. North Vietnamese yeah. or something Yeah, exactly. Like exactly. It, was the, it was the way to guarantee that, that they were talking to the legitimate you know, people. Now you said that the, these South Vietnamese were military were fairly well trained and yes, this they was, operated very yeah. well, even if the medevac helicopters <laughs> didn't show up, but the military yeah, Right. Was now the, the Vietnamese there. Rangers were, along with the Vietnamese Airborne, uh, they, there was a Special Forces, uh, Vietnamese Special Forces for a while, but they actually were folded into the Rangers uh, in the end of 1970. Uh, they were all elite troops. They were all very well trained. The, there were sometimes problems with the senior uh, command because they tended to be quite political, but the the troops were were excellent. They were as good as uh, American units I worked with. And when you were over there, you were wounded, but yes. um, thankfully not seriously. Um, <laughs> Luckily, not seriously. But seriously, yes. maybe you could uh, tell us about that incident. Right. Might kind of show us the kind of combat or hostilities right. you were in. Well, when we were in Cambodia, we crossed the border. This is the second time, actually. The first time. Uh, in the middle of April 1970, the Vietnamese crossed the border, and the Americans were required to stay on the Vietnamese side of the border. So we stayed. So we dropped off basically right at the border and acted as, as liaison, you know, reporting what was happening. But, but we were not allowed into Cambodia. The uh, and then uh, about two and a half weeks later, uh, after an operation up into the Central Highlands, we uh, we went back and crossed the border into uh, into uh, 
Cambodia, and this time the Americans weren't allowed to cross the border. Although when they first crossed, I was uh, on the American side of the border with uh, with a uh, American unit from the 25th Infantry, Infantry Division, uh, and you know they acted as liaison so that if they needed artillery support or that sort of thing, and they went, needed to know where they were firing, they they did it through me. Uh, but then when they were uh, allowed to cross the border after about two days, then I uh, rejoined my unit. And so the rest of the time I was in Cambodia. And it was a, a task force. The, the Vietnamese, they had uh, about three or four task force that, that operated in Cambodia in this operation. And uh, each task force had a, an armored cavalry unit and then a, an infantry unit, which was the Rangers. Right? So they had uh, armored personnel carriers and uh, tanks, you know, you know, real stuff. Right? And then the, the Rangers would serve as the infantry support. And so we'd ride on it. Now, after we'd been there a couple of weeks, they they sort of stopped the advance, and then they sent uh, a unit that I was with. It was a, an armored cavalry squadron, I guess. It was like 15 armored personnel carriers and a couple of tanks, and then a company of Vietnamese Rangers for infantry support. And we did this two-day operation, sort of in the rear area, but still in Cambodia, in the Parrot Speak area of Cambodia, and. Uh, the, uh, on the second day, we had uh, was like seven or eight uh, spots on the map that we were supposed to look at, targets. Right? And uh, on the, about noontime the second day, we stopped in this area that was heavily bunkered, and we were checking out the bunkers and things. And uh, I was a senior American on this. The, uh, the other American was a cavalry advisor, a sergeant. Right? And the senior American got to sit on the command top of the command armored personnel carrier in a jeep seat, right? And the, the uh, CAV commander had a jeep seat on the other side of it. Everybody else just sat on the, on the steel. All right, so it was pretty comfortable. Right? In fact, it was a little too comfortable. I used to fall asleep a lot. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so, yeah, right. So we're, we're riding along after we started up again early afternoon, and right after lunch, and the, um, we had two more objectives to, to check out. And so I had a, a huge, uh, plastic map case that I had made when I first got in, in, uh, in Vietnam. And I had the map all folded down and then with grease pencil marked on it, the, the, the objectives. And, I, and so it was folded down, sticking in the you know, spot right in my feet. And, uh, and I remember looking up and I could see off in the distance uh, this brushy area, the low brush area. And in Cambodia, uh, it was just dead flat. It's the Mekong River Valley. And delta, and you know, just absolutely flat. And then there would be clusters of vegetation in a ring around buildings. They're little hamlets, right? And they would all be closed in with bamboo, so you couldn't actually see into any one of them. And they were sort of scattered around, so that you, in some cases, you could see uh, for miles. In fact, you could see the the edge of the Cambodian uh, Vietnamese border just north of there, which was we, we call it the straight edge woods because it was just perfectly straight, and uh, I mean, it was, I don't know, probably 10 miles, 15 miles away, and they could just barely see it in the distance, and the, uh, uh, we're, so we're riding along, and I can see up ahead, maybe a kilometer, I see the little brushy area, so I look at the map, I go, all right, that brushy area, I figure, is a kilometer east of the next objective. Put it back, kind of doze off, it was hot. And, uh, and the next thing I know, uh, there's this uh, noise of bullets bouncing off the side of the armored, armored personnel carrier and going past me. And bullets make a very distinct sound when they, when they go by you. I mean, you can, you can tell they're, they're close like and they're going by. Or like a bee it's, or it's something. It's almost like a, it's almost like a crack. It's almost like a crack, right? And, uh, and I look up and maybe 50, 60 feet away, is this brushy area and nothing but gun smoke coming out of it, right? And uh, and we're right in the middle of the kill zone, right? And so we start. So I did what everybody else did: was jump down inside the armored personnel carrier. The top was open. It had a huge hatch. It's like a four by four foot hatch, and it was folded back open, right? So you could jump down inside. And this particular armored personnel carrier had a cupola on the front that had a thirty caliber machine gun, right, protecting the machine gunner. And so he starts firing at them and we start backing up. Right? And uh, I reach for my M16 to you know, stand there and shoot a little bit. What are you going to do? It's a firefight. You know? And uh, 
Then they started shooting at us from a different angle. <laughs> and, uh, and so I ducked back down with everybody else, and I figured, well, it's time to call my sergeant. So uh, it was at the higher headquarters, right, our base area in Cambodia. So I called him up on the radio and said that we're in a firefight, and uh, I'd let him know if we needed uh, helicopter gunships or something like that. And, uh, and he, uh, he went, okay, so I'm thinking about what to do next. And the, the CAV commander and the Vietnamese fort observer stand up. And I'm thinking, oh, no, i got to stand up. I don't like standing up in firefights. And just as I was running out of excuses to stand up, they, a mortar round hit the top of the armored personnel carrier about that far away from my head. And the shrapnel came down inside and got everybody. And I got hit in the back of my arm. And uh, I'm not really sure how it just hit me there, but that's all. And uh, killed the, 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 the two people standing up, because they just took it you know, head up. And, uh, and it just wounded everybody else. So I called my sergeant and said, you know, we need a medevac. Yeah. How did that make you feel? I mean, that you were that close. I mean, what kind of emotions you have then or, or later, knowing that well, if you had stood up, you... Yeah, you I thought about it later. I didn't think about it then because, you know, basically going to... I mean, I was bleed, I bled a lot. And it sort of went into shock. But, uh, and then we backed up enough to be out of the, the kill zone and then crawled out of the armored personnel carrier. And uh, I went to, to put the headphones back on that got blown off my head in, in the blast and the, um, actually punctured an eardrum. And, the, uh, and I went to reach up for the, for the uh, microphone. And the next thing I remember, lying on the ground looking up at it. And about that time, a Vietnamese medic came by and bandaged me up. And, uh, and then eventually, the, it wasn't a medevac chopper, it was the uh, thing command and control chopper for the higher headquarters that came, picked us all up and brought us back to the to their area. And then a dust off medevac chopper showed up, took yeah. us to the hospital. Yeah. Now you didn't you left Vietnam after that, after well, you didn't care for that and then yeah. but you were still in the military for quite a while after right. that. Let's show you were in different different units right. as well. Now this would have been This was this was the this was the, the Vietnamese Ranger beret that we wore in Vietnam, not on operations but any other time. And in Vietnam, all the advisors wore American rank on the collar, and then Vietnamese rank on the on the uh, it, on the you know on the uh -huh. jer jersey and on the uh, on the beret. And this is the Vietnamese rank for first lieutenant Trung Nguyen. Uh -huh. And uh, and then this pin is this, really a representation of this patch. Right. And we'll try and get a photo up yeah. on that that shows wings and, right. and an arrow. It's very very distinctive, very nice right. patch. For what is that for? That's, that's the symbol for Vietnamese Rangers. The, the Rangers that yep. were at that time. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you also received some other commendations and right. things. Right, well, this is the, photos of. Right. The, this is the Vietnamese Ranger badge that we wore. And, uh, and this was a combat infantryman's badge that you were awarded if you were uh, in a combat unit, like an infantry unit, and you were shot at. <laughs> but, uh, you, you also received a Purple Heart. I also got a Purple, purple Heart. heart yeah. and, and this is uh, Greek jump wings they got when I was in Special Forces. Yeah, that'll yeah. I'll tell that story too. And then yeah. this one was from Vietnam. Yeah, this is the mm -hmm. combat patch, Mac V patch, Military Advisory Command, Vietnam. Yeah. Right. Well, because after you were treated for your wounds, you right. went on and stayed in the military for a while. And right. You... Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, they send you to the hospital nearest your home. In my case, that was in Massachusetts, Fort Devens, and the. Uh, and then when they asked me what, where I wanted to go, I said, well, I want to stay here. This is the, the hospital commander. And uh, he, uh, he said, well, there's not much here but special forces. And I went, oh, I can do that. <laughs> and so after I, a month of convalescent leave, that was a month of hospital in Japan, a month of convalescent leave. And then uh, he went, I got back to the hospital. He said, well, yeah, I have orders for, for 10 special forces group, Green Berets. All right. So, uh, so I joined them, and then I ended up spending an extra, and I spent like, almost two years with them. Green. Right, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the, the green patch means it's 10th group. Green, green. Right, and, uh, and they, uh, they told me that if I stayed in, but went voluntary and definite, that they'd send me to Special Forces Officers course to be Special Forces qualified. And, uh, and I actually contemplated staying in as a career. Some of my friends did, but then I decided to get out. Spent the rest of my life in school. <laughs> it's surprising that as a Green Beret you weren't sent back to Vietnam. Well, they were, 
they were closing everything down at that point. There was, uh, they actually brought all the, they, they, they shut down the, the uh, special forces camps in, the, in late uh, 1970 and uh, made them into a Vietnamese ranger group. So they were, uh, you know, there, were, there wasn't that much call for, for those sorts of things. And yeah. they, uh, they were still running 46 company in, in Thailand, but that was virtually impossible to get into. Okay. So. Well, you also actually kept a journal while right. you were there. Do you have anything in there from when you were wounded? You put, did you put well, no, your thoughts? Or just uh, I didn't write anything when I was wounded. So, I, I mean, not at yeah. when you were wounded, but well, No, but this is most, it's mostly notes that I took uh, during the... Yeah, yeah, I'm just going to show it. Just yeah. a small, kind of like nowadays they call yeah. it a little moleskin, right. little memoranda right. books. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was actually, it says memoranda. It was actually issued in Vietnam, and it was, oh. it was for keeping notes, uh, things like frequencies, uh, oh. notes from briefings. Uh, I mean, I, I was reminded when I looked at this a little bit ago that, that one of the first uh, call signs for a group was greedy gland. And um, our our call sign was Patty Sinus, so I was Patty Sinus Seven One. Right? <laughs> Patty but, Sinus. Yeah, I know. But the uh, the last call sign I had in Vietnam, and and we changed them once a month. Uh -huh. But because we went into Cambodia in May, they didn't change it that month. So I had this call sign for for six weeks, Snorty Raisin, and my brother still calls <laughs> me that. Snorty, how did they come up with it? Did they like it was S R, and then somebody just made up a word? No, it was. It was there were letters? random words that a computer generated. Wow. Yeah. Oh my God, they were using yeah. a computer. Really yeah. So the uh, so the higher headquarters that month, uh, the group headquarters was likely freezer, but uh, but I loved their alternate call sign, which was certain mortar. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought that was kind of appropriate. But, you seem very well adjusted, like that. You know, professionally and personally. Yeah. It, it, well, it didn't get you down, and you found a way to cope and live with. Yeah, well, I, you know, it, it probably helped a lot that I spent two years in special forces after Vietnam, and you know, working with with lots of people who were in Vietnam, and, and uh, I will admit that there was several times when I when I had flashbacks some years later, but mostly triggered by songs actually. Really, what yeah. kind of songs? Uh, you know the Holly song, "He Ain't Heavy, He's My Brother." Yeah. Well, that they played that all the time when I was first in Vietnam. And uh, and I and I hadn't heard it for a while, and it was it was like ten years later, and, and the uh, I heard that on the radio, and I could see the signs, you know, in Vietnamese, I could smell the mud. Uh, it was it was really vivid, right? So I play the song all the time now, so that it doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's but, an interesting way. Yeah, well, yeah, know, because you know, it, it just associated those memories, right. and it really strongly. It was, it was amazing. The smell, and they say smell yeah. is one of your strongest yeah. senses for, yeah, and, for and, long ago memories. Yes, and there were very dis very distinct smells in Vietnam. Because you were near jungle areas, as you said. Well, it was, yeah, it was more, it was more open areas. than that. But uh, up in the mountains, it was, it was jungle. But, the, uh, but the, uh, the other sort of common smell was uh, the Vietnamese used a fish sauce called nuk mong, and it was made from steaming rotted fish and then condensing it. And it is the foulest smelling stuff you'd ever imagine, right? But uh, and they used it with, you know, chicken and rice, you'd sort of dip it in. And it really tasted good, it really added to the flavor of the, the chicken and rice. And surprisingly- different, different from the smell. Well, yeah, it was. But, but after a while, it sort of ooze out of your pores. Yeah. Well, we need to wind up in a minute. Yeah. I just wondered if you, if, if you could summarize, like, did you get some useful skills out of the military that helped you in your professional life, or you know, as as a working yeah. adult? Well, yeah, no, no question about it. When when I first, you know, when I quit school, you know, at twenty, the uh, I was just tired of school, and and I never studied much or anything else. And uh, and after four years in the military, uh, if I learned nothing else, I learned self discipline, and it was really not a problem to to. to uh, to study or you know stay ahead of the game that sort of thing get up early in the morning obviously you know. the importance of education you're yeah. to get a phd after that well yeah i mean yeah yeah well stayed in school forever but it was it but it was it was amazing it was like night and day the the difference and uh, i mean i'm not sure i used any gun skills or anything. no but you know but 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 self discipline was uh, was really you know important it was it was a very different experience 
Thank you so much for speaking that with us. We really sure. appreciate we appreciate your service then. Thank you. Thank you.